Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War Two TV and my Normandy 78th anniversary absence. And I'm absolutely shattered and Mag is absolutely shattered. But we're back to do shows again. And at some point I will be doing some reactions about what the Normandy anniversary was, was like and what things I saw. But it won't be yet because we go back into regular programming. If you are new to the channel or you haven't watched us for a while, don't forget to like everything you, you see. Leave comments, share what we're doing. It's all good for the analytics. It all helps us get more views. So today we are looking at the Battle of Midway, but we are not going to be looking at it from the flight deck, aircraft types, mission. That It's more of a geopolitical kind of context um, view of it. Look at some of the uh, uh, repercussions after the Battle of Midway, how it was um, panned out. And my expert today is a or the author of this recently published book, The Man Who Won the War World War II, and you'll find out who that man is on the cover, although I suspect many of you already know who that is on the cover there. We're covering other aspects beyond the, that's code breaking, but we'll cover that later on. But basically, I'm going to bring him in now. So, Henry James, so good evening. How are you? You're muted. You're muted. You've muted, muted yourself. I'm no. Mute. There we go. How's that? How's yeah, that? we're good. Well, good oh, afternoon, Henry. You. So you're over there in, in, in the USA, and Midway is your subject. So um, first of all, what's your background? Because you don't define yourself as a military historian. What's your background, Henry? Well, mostly I've uh, written a lot of history about uh, the New Deal and the Roosevelt administration and some about Lend-Lease. And uh, uh, I apprenticed under uh, a fellow named Alex Haley back in the 80s, who... Uh, had some success with some history. Uh, mostly my background is in politics and political science. And I've looked at uh, one of the aspects of World War II that is not explored enough, in my opinion, is the fact that a lot of the decisions that were made during World War II, at least on the American side, were made on the basis of domestic political uh, situation on the ground in the US, for example, uh, the uh, America First movement and the isolationist movement, and even specific military operations like the Doolittle Raid. That wasn't really a military operation. It was designed to get newspaper headlines in the, in the U.S. So I've looked at it from a political point of view. And the Battle of Midway has always interested me because it was a fa uh, it's called an incredible victory for the U.S. Navy, and it was. Uh, but it came at a time when... Uh, the uh, Roosevelt administration was trying to shift the emphasis away from uh, just fighting the Japanese who had attacked at Pearl Harbor and the American people wanted uh, us to go after the Japanese hammer and tong. But Roosevelt and Churchill, and I think rightly so, saw Hitler as the existential threat. And uh, uh, that was the, the, the focus of certainly of Churchill and Roosevelt tried to do that as well. And we can get into to some of that, but the, the politics uh, that that would have changed had that battle not gone the way it had when it did is 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 frightening. It really is. But we can get into we will get that into and that. that's as I said there, Henry, it's that people you know they dive deep into the weeds about you know as I said in the introduction their flight decks and and timings and bombs and torpedoes and who said what and that minute time where where carriers were hit and which flight did what. And, and that's all absolutely fascinating stuff. But all the focus on that is avoiding looking at this big picture of how it sits in the political kind of discourse and uh, and progression of the war. So you've come with a PowerPoint. Today, folks, what we're going to do is Henry's going to go through his presentation in kind of one go, and then we'll do questions and comments at the end. So uh, I'll fire it up on screen, Henry, and then basically it'll be over to you. So we're calling it... It's kind of a clickbait title, folks. Ten facts about the Battle of Midway, everyone should know. But there are going to be ten points that um, Henry is making, and we'll go. Some of them are very quick, and some of them are a bit longer. So I'm going to hand over to Henry now to take us through his ten points. So, uh, so over to you now with our first slide. Well, uh, pictured is a a, a military uh, theorist named Alfred uh, Thayer Mahan, and he wrote a very influential book in the late 1800s called. Uh, the influence of sea power upon history. And the Mahan's doctrines were followed by every great power navy in the world, the Japanese, the British, the Americans, certainly, um, uh, the French, the Germans, the Italians, everybody followed Mahan's doctrine. And he had the idea and first promulgated it that to be a superpower or a power, great power, you had to have a big navy. 
And the way you used it was that you would have a decisive battle. You would get all your ships together and your enemy would get all their ships together and whoever had the biggest guns would win. And of course you wanted to have the biggest guns. And Mahan's doctrine led to the uh, creation of the dreadnought, which is the forerunner of the modern battleship. The Japanese uh, used Mahan's doctrines to some effect in the Battle of Tsushima in uh, 1905 and completely destroyed the Russian fleet in a very famous naval battle. Uh, and wanted to uh, have and maintain a navy that was at least the equivalent of the Royal Navy in the Pacific uh, and the U.S. Navy in the Pacific. And that was very hard for the Japanese to do. The Royal Navy had the benefit of the fact that uh, England, the United Kingdom, Britain, had its own reserves of uh, coal and iron ore and could uh, build steel ships. And it had the British Empire to supply the rest of it. And America, of course, had uh, great riches of natural resources. The Japanese didn't really have any. And they spent the 1920s and 30s on a quest for the natural resources necessary to build and maintain a blue water navy of that equivalency. And they didn't have a lot of luck with it. So they turned to, uh, by 1940, however, uh, looking across at the Pacific, a lot of these European colonies that were uh, possessions or colonies of European powers were uh, in disarray because the uh, uh, mother country had been overrun by the Germans, uh, France, for example, uh, uh, the Dutch. And so they, the Japanese thought that these uh, former European colonies or European colonies could be ripe for the taking. They could go take the uh, French Indochina. They could take the Dutch East Indies for the oil, which they desperately needed. They could take Malaya and uh, Singapore for tin and aluminum and, and so forth. Uh, the only uh, forces that could possibly stop them were the Royal Navy, which didn't have that much uh, uh, power in the Pacific at that time because the Royal Navy was desperately fighting the Battle of the Atlantic. So the only Navy that really could thwart their ambitions would be the United States Navy. And so they decided that they would try to neuter the uh, U.S. Naval forces with the attack on Pearl Harbor. And to a degree, they did that. I mean, they damaged or sank all the battleships of the Pacific Fleet. But of course, the aircraft carriers were not there. And so uh, they were uh, unscathed. For the next few months, the Imperial Japanese Navy was rampant throughout the Pacific, uh, taking these various colonies and possessions until they got down to Port Moresby uh, in, in New Guinea and was going to have an amphibious assault at Port Moresby, which was a stepping stone. The next step would be, of course, taking Australia. And that got interfered with, with uh, two carriers that uh, Admiral Nimitz was able to uh, uh, put in their way. And we, we, from that, we get the Battle of Coral Sea. And from at least that moment on, Admiral Yamamoto knew that he was going to have to go ahead and deal with the remaining U.S. forces in the Pacific once and for all. And the question becomes, well, how do you do that, according to Mahan? And you have to end up taking something that the Americans would absolutely have to put everything into to take back. And it doesn't take too long looking at the map uh, to figure out that that would be Midway. And, you know, as often depicted, Midway is this lone island out in the middle of nowhere Pacific. But that's really not true. Midway is actually the first habitable island in the Hawaiian island chain. If you could go to the next slide. There we go. You can see Midway up there. It's part of the Hawaiian island chain. So you have the headquarters of the Pacific Fleet at one end of the Hawaiian Islands, if they take Midway, then you would have a Japanese naval and air base at the other end of the Hawaiian Islands. And that's not only untenable, it's unthinkable. And so the Americans would have to do everything they, they could to take Midway back. And in the course of that, uh, Yamamoto would be able to have his decisive battle. He would, in his mind, destroy the remaining American forces in the Pacific. Uh, what was left of them would have to retreat back to California from where the Pacific Fleet came in 1940. The Pacific Fleet historically had not been based at Pearl Harbor. It had been based at various California ports. It was only moved to Pearl Harbor in 1940 because President Roosevelt wanted to do a show of force. And just to so ask you okay. about, about, about Pearl Harbor, because I was talking to my friend Ross Cable, an Australian lieutenant colonel, and we were talking about the fact that 
on December the 7th, because of the international date line, it gets a little bit confusing. But the Japanese, you know, attacked at the same time, Singapore, Hong Kong, Pearl Harbor, the, uh, the Philippines and what have you. And and because of that, because of the civilian reaction to the striking of the, the uh, America's heartland, although it wasn't really heartland, but Pearl Harbor, it, it was striking the USA. To, for Americans, has the has the idea of, it, of Japanese needing resources been a bit kind of overshadowed by the the the, the actual attack on the harbor itself? Oh, I think so because you know when you, you if you don't study this sp specifically to some academic end, if you just pick up a book and read through it, I mean World War II starts in in America with the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, and it's like no explanation of why or what they were trying to do. If you dig back into their history, well, let me ask you a question, because if you ask an American, when did World War II start? You're going to get December 7, 1941. Yeah. As a Briton slash European, if I ask you, I'm guessing you're going to give me September 1st, 1939, something like that. Well, I, w I would have done in the past, but as I'm getting more global, I'm now thinking it's you know it's the Jap Jap you know, Japanese Chinese War probably is the is really the the, the tipping point, uh, and yeah. then September and Poland and what have you. But a lot of Brits would really kind of think about it being uh, the Battle of Britain in a sense because there's that still that phony war period, which wasn't really a phony war, especially if you were in Poland at the time, because there was nothing phony about what was happening there. But I think various people around the world have different ideas of when when the war commences. And I think that that's a bit of a, an, an ongoing issue. Well, if you, yes, a lot of historians would, would tell you it would be the second Sino-Japanese uh, War in 37. Yeah. Some scholars would tell you it's, it would be 1931. My own view is that the war between Japan and America began on July 8th, 1853. <laughs> and that's when uh, Japan up to that point was an agrarian feudal nation that wanted to be left alone and did not want to be, they saw all this colonization going along. They did not want to be a colony of America or Britain or France or Germany or anybody. And they uh, had no relationships with other countries. They, it was it was a policy they call Sakoku, where basically foreigners keep out. And that was the, the way it was until uh, Commodore Perry sailed his four gunboats into Edo Bay on July 8, 1853. And they had never seen steam-powered ships before, and they'd never seen big guns. And the way Perry tells it, because it was within a few days of America's Independence Day, he sailed his ships around the harbor and fired off celebratory salutes. Well, it scared the bejesus out of the J Japanese population. Never seen anything like that. It would be, it would be like if aliens landed today. Mm. And from that moment on, it really completely changed Japanese the society and their political system. Uh, the emperor was restored. us where you get the Meiji Restoration. And they decided then and there that the only way that they were going to remain a an independent people with their own identity would be to develop a navy of this similar to what the British and the Americans had. And they spent the next couple of decades doing just that, culminating in that tremendous victory at Tsushima in 1905. So uh, these things have a very long history of how you get from point A to point B. I mean, it's not just nobody in Japan woke up one day and decided that they would bomb Pearl Harbor. It was all part of an elaborate uh, uh, planning process that took years and in some cases decades to to kind of figure out right so so meanwhile back to 1942 and midway thank you for that wonderful history lesson there that was that was brilliant so um, we're back to the idea of a, of, a, of a blow that will take bring the fleet out the american fleet out so what uh now they had uh, and we have this international dateline problem as to when the attack on wake island takes place but it was immediately after Pearl Harbor, the Japanese assaulted Wake Island. It was an outpost garrison. And the first amphibious assault did not go well, and the Japanese had tremendous casualties because they didn't realize how much air power and how many ships with big guns it was going to take to soften the beaches up enough that the amphibious operation would work. Uh, they came back two weeks later with uh, more firepower and uh, figured that out. So the second assault at Wake Island actually worked. Consequently, when they planned the Midway invasion, they knew what it was going to take for them to have a successful assault 
of a United States garrisoned outpost uh, like Midway. And they brought twice the amount of power it would take to do that for fleet carriers and a lot of support ships with big guns. But they also brought the entire combined fleet that was to set off several hundred miles behind the Midway invasion force. So the idea was they would have, it would only take one massive air assault to subdue the air forces on Midway. Then the ships would come in and pummel the beaches and then the amphibious forces would land. The next step would be repairing the runways and bringing onto Midway equi the equivalent of an aircraft carrier's worth of planes. So now you have an unsinkable aircraft carrier. And by that time, you have, would have roused the attention of the uh, Navy at Pearl Harbor, who would then try to gather their forces together and go up with a relief operation to take Midway back. That was the plan. Um, they would have a submarine cordon in place by then. They would be able to track uh, uh, Nimitz's relief forces every move, probably a trip some of it before it gets there. When Nimitz forces arrived at Midway to counter the assault forces, all, then and only then would he discover the curtain would be pulled back and he would discover that it was a trap and Midway was just the cheese. And he would ha be in a surprise meeting engagement with the entire, essentially the entire Imperial Japanese Navy. And the force differential between what the Japanese brought to bear at Midway and what Nimitz had available to him there's just no way he could have prevailed. I mean, he would have lost. The question is, would it have been uh, a massive loss or would it have been absolutely catastrophic? And so, um, but there's no amount of tactical genius that could overcome uh, that great of a force disparity. So that was kind of their plan. Uh, however, <clears throat> as you well know, the best laid plans sometimes go awry. <clears throat> And <clears throat> pardon me, this is uh, certainly a case of that <clears throat> because uh, before the uh, before all that plan started uh, unfolding itself, uh, a Navy captain named Joseph Roachford, and he's the subject of the cover of the book, who was a cryptanalyst. Uh, in an operation on Hawaii and the basement of the 14th Naval District building known as Hypo, had finally gotten enough uh, Japanese traffic to decode uh, the JN-25 code that was used between the senior commanders of the Imperial Japanese Navy. Now, uh, this has been covered as nauseum about uh, why didn't they break JN-25 before Pearl Harbor and uh, there wasn't enough JN-25 traffic uh, transmitted in peacetime uh, to be able to apply the statistical tools necessary to do that. That's really an impossibility, but it doesn't really matter because they didn't transmit the plans in JN-25 anyway. So they didn't have to. The, all the ship's captains were in port. They could just hand them a printed copy of the thing uh, before the, but after Pearl Harbor, with the Imperial Japanese Navy spread out all over the Pacific, the only way you could communicate and coordinate uh, another attack would be using the radio. And not only did jo uh, Roachford uh, was he able to read Yamamoto's battle plan, but he could do it more than a month in advance of the Midway invasion. And so that month head start gave Admiral Nimitz some huge advantages that, frankly, he took absolute advantage of every one of them. The first thing that Nimitz did, well, look, Roachford told him that, by the way, the Japanese are overflying Hawaiian waters in their float planes because they are able to refuel them by submarine from French frigate shoals, which is a, a, a tall that's in between Midway and uh, Pearl Harbor. So Nimitz stationed some uh, support ships there to deny uh, that refueling operation from taking place. Now that has a couple of effects. One, it denies them real-time intelligence about what's in Pearl Harbor. Uh, and and that, that uh, ended, ends up uh, really uh, figuring into their battle plans because because they couldn't see something that was in Pearl Harbor. They just assumed they knew what was there because they couldn't prove otherwise. And so that was one of the, even though it doesn't sound like much that you deny refueling operation, it, it had profound effects later on. But in any case, that was kind of the first thing he did. And the, the second thing he did was he contacted the Marine garrison on Guadal uh, excuse me, on uh, Midway and, and told them that a major Japanese 
amphibious assault was going to occur in a month. And he said, what do you need to stop it? And if you look at what they had, they had a fair good number of men, but you know, the weapons that they had were leftovers from World War I. They had obsolete Vindicator uh, bombers. They had very obsolete F2F Brewster Buffalo fighters. Uh, it was just a mishmash of, because it was just an outpost. And so they started putting together a list of the things that they would need to, to uh, prevent this invasion from being a success. And uh, in a surprise, Admiral Nimitz flew out to Midway on May the 2nd with his entire staff to see for himself on the ground and to talk to those commanders. And when he did, they handed him, basically, it was like a Sears catalog. And he was really taken aback because they wanted everything. They wanted all these anti-aircraft units, which basically has got to strip them out of Hawaii. They wanted uh, Devastator bombers and F-4F fighters and a squadron of B-17s and more men and mines and barbed wire and explosives and guns of every description. And Nimitz was really taken aback by that. And then he said, if I get you these things, can you prevent this invasion? And they said, yes, sir. If you get us these things, we'll stop it. So he, he had a month to do it. And then from that moment on, 24 hours a day, they were pushing all these reinforcements in the Midway, which if you look at those, it's actually Midway is not an island. It's an atoll, atoll. It consists of two islands, Sand, which is the larger of the two, and Eastern, the smaller of the two. And the runways are on Eastern. And together, these two islands soaking wet are only 1,600 acres. And when you look at the massive amount of reinforcements that uh, Nimitz put on those two islands, I mean, I don't know where they put the planes. They put more than, I think, 110 uh, airplanes on Sand Island, and it is, uh, it's very small, excuse me, on Eastern Island, it is very, very small. So uh, I, from just the sheer weight of all those reinforcements, I'm surprised that the islands didn't sink, but they held up. But it would have been a, a, a real shock if the Japanese had, uh, had tried to do that. But those reinforcements, which if you read a lot of the books about the Battle of Midway, one take on it is they really did no good. Those planes flew out. They hardly ever got a hit. The B-17s overflew the carriers and dropped bombs on them from 20,000 feet, and not one of them hit. But two things happened. One of them was in the midst of this very well-planned attack that the Japanese uh, had conceived of, all of a sudden they were being attacked from 360 degrees by a lot of aircraft coming off midway they didn't even think should be there. And yes, their carriers were nimble enough that they could avoid the bombs, but it started discombobulating their decision-making process at very high levels because it started getting confused and uh, about what was really going on. And that confusion only gets worse as, as the day progresses. But the most important thing about those reinforcements is not that they did a lot of damage because they didn't, was the fact that when the Japanese finally did launch their air assault against Midway, because they were only going to need one, it turns out that that one air assault was not enough to subdue the air power on Midway. They had to have a second assault. And the fact that they had to have a second assault, and we're going to get into that in another point, that is really the thing that lit the fuse to the, the, the their, their whole problem, was the, the need for that uh, second assault. Now, there are two yeah. other things. So I just want to bring back to a point because Norma Graham, who's a, a, a regular watcher of the channel, going back to talking about Nimitz being wise enough to listen to this information, because we're, we're living in an era now where we completely understand, looking back from 80 years, the importance of SIG intelligence, signals intelligence, the importance of code breaking, how remarkable it was, ultra in the ETO, all that stuff there. But back in 41, 42, it was an unproven uh, resource. So, you know, it, I think we have to kind of go back and just give Nimitz a pat on the back for this information. Now, of course, you maybe will explain the fact they did, you know, they sent that test message out to make sure that, the, the, you know, that the, the Japanese, it really was midway. So they, they do double check their information. But what's your take on, on how risky Nimitz is, um, instinct to go with this because and people already commented on roche for having the you know the slippers and the dressing gown and stuff like that and i know you're going to point make out that some of that is a little bit of a hollywood exaggeration but nimitz and taking this information on board i mean what how, how big a bigger um a thing was that well 
You know, I think the fact that Nimitz was able to incorporate these, for that time, new, innovative, modern uh, tools of warfare, uh, I think that makes him one of the, the, the first modern naval commanders in history because he was able to incorporate them. And as you know, we had a lot of naval commanders who didn't understand radar and didn't understand radio and uh, cryptography. They, they, and they did not use those tools that had been developed uh, to our advantage. Nimitz was not one. However, I don't think it was very risky because he talked to Rochford about this. And Rochford told him, he said, you know, if I'm wrong, it's just going to cost you some fuel because you'll be up there on the other side of Midway ready to ambush them. And if it turns out that this information is completely bogus, then you can come back to Pearl Harbor and refuel and go do your thing. But if I'm right and the Navy again misses the, an opportunity like this, then, you know, there'll be hell to pay. And so uh, I, I don't think that uh, it, it was that high a risk because they had to be somewhere. Uh, but, uh, Nimitz did believe Rochford mostly because Nimitz trusted his intelligence chief, who was a captain, Edwin Layton and Layton and Rochford first met on a steamer en route to Japan in the 1920s, where both of them, uh, were Japanese language students, uh, on behalf of the Navy. And, uh, they spent a couple of years there together in Japan, learning Japanese and their careers had uh, intertwined several times uh, since then. And Leighton knew that Rochford was a very solid guy. And when he said he knew something, he knew it. And uh, so I don't think it was that risky, but I still do agree with you. He deserves at least a pat on the back because he's really one of the first modern naval commanders that who could uh, use the aircraft carrier properly, uh, radar and communications intelligence that was also new. And I was going to mention this later, but to contrast Nimitz, the day before the Midway assault was to take place, which is June 4th of 42, there was a, another operation that involved a small number of ships that was to take place in the Aleutians. It's called the Aleutians Campaign. And Nim, uh, Rochford also discovered that was going to take place on the 3rd. And Nimitz sent Admiral Theobald up to the Alaskan waters with a small task force to try to interfere with that uh, small Japanese uh, assault that was going to take place. And Theobald did not understand the intelligence that he got, and he didn't think that it was accurate. And he thought the Japanese surely wouldn't attack where this information is telling me there's someplace else. So he goes off in another direction. And on June 3rd, when the Japanese did attack uh, Attu and Kiska, uh, Theobald was nowhere around. So uh, he was transferred to command, I believe, the Boston Navy Yard from then and was embittered by it. Uh, and later, after the war, Theobald writes a book about how Roosevelt knew about Pearl Harbor. And it's really the start of the Roosevelt knew myth was came from Theobald. But I would say in all fairness to Theobald, he wasn't told where that information came from and how accurate it was. And if you look at his career, he had been getting naval intelligence, you know, for 30 years in the Navy. And it was rumor and water cooler talk and mere speculation. It wasn't reading the actual document word for word. Rochford knew that on June 4th at 0700 hours, four aircraft carriers, and he named them, would be 135 degrees off of Midway launching a strike 200 miles out. I mean, that's a drop mic type of event if you can do that after the the assault uh nimitz goes to him and said well you were five minutes five degrees and five miles out so um uh, but that was kind of that uh but anyway uh the next step that nimitz took and these are critical uh is he needed some air power and to do that he needed uh, yorktown which had been heavily damaged at the battle of coral sea it was en route to the Navy Yard at Bremerton, Washington, for what was estimated to be a three-month overhaul to make it combat ready. And he, instead, he had it diverted to Pearl Harbor. Now, they had at Pearl Harbor in the Navy Yard the blueprints for Yorktown. And they were able to radio the ship and find out where is the damage, where are the frames and the plates 
And they started making the replacements for those before that ship uh, ever got to Pearl Harbor. And when it got close enough that they could fly some planes out, they flew engineers out from Pearl Harbor who could see the damage for themselves then fly back to Pearl Harbor and make the necessary arrangements and modifications. So when the Yorktown finally pulls into Pearl Harbor and to dry dock, uh, it was uh, swarmed with 1,400 dockyard workers who took these parts they pre-made. And they welded on Yorktown for three days. That's all the amount of time they had because that ship had to, had to join the other, other ships. And they, they had so much uh, electric arc welding going on on Yorktown, they actually blacked out parts of Honolulu. But wow. uh, And even when they left, uh, even when the Yorktown pulled out, uh, those dockyard workers, a lot of them remained on the ship and they worked on it all the way up to the time of the battle. But in any case, by the time they finished, Yorktown was now combat worthy again. So he had an aircraft carrier. Now he had two other aircraft carriers, two good aircraft carriers. He had Enterprise and Hornet, and those were down in the South Pacific. And he wanted to bring those back to Hawaiian waters because of the midway uh, attack that was going to take place. And Admiral King, who was chief of naval operations, wouldn't let him. King wouldn't let him because uh, the there had been a shakeup in naval communications and intelligence in the wake of the Pearl Harbor debacle. There was a Admiral... Uh, Redmond, who was chief of naval communications, and he saw that as an opportunity to appoint his little brother as chief of naval intelligence, communications intelligence. And it becomes known to us in history as the Redmond Cabal. There were others involved in it, but they were the, the two principal ones. Well, the younger brother was feeding uh, King all of these appreciations about where the Japanese were going to attack next. They were going to attack in the South Pacific. They were going to attack Hawaii. Alaska, California, Panama Canal, Johnston Atoll, everywhere. He was seeing ghosts under every bed. And so King was having Nimitz, you know, move his ships around based on this intelligence that was coming out of this um, not very well thought. I mean, it's an awful, at that time, it was an awful intelligence operation. Uh, but that's, King believed it. And so that's, this is where you get the conflict between what King was telling Nimitz and what Nimitz wanted to do and between the Redmond brothers and Rochford. So this is kind of a backstory that we're going to get into a little bit. But uh, so, so, and King, by the way, had a reputation, he, he had a reputation of, he's the kind of guy who shaves with the blowtorch. And when Nimitz mentioned the moving those carriers back to Hawaii for this, uh, King just went off on it. So, what Nimitz did was he secretly radioed Admiral Halsey, who's the task force commander, and told him to start uh, uh, operating conspicuously so that the Japanese would become aware of his task force's presence, opposite of the normal doctrine. And Halsey did that, and sure enough, the Japanese scout plane uh, spotted Halsey's task force. So now that he's been spotted by the Japanese, uh, Nimitz can recall those two carriers back to Hawaiian waters. So now he's got three carriers. It had a secondary effect as well, because now the Japanese have spotted two American carriers down in the South Pacific, and they've been denied real-time intelligence from Hawaiian waters. So they think they know where these carriers are. Uh, and so that kind of is kind of the setup of how that happened. Um, and we can get into some of the details of that of that battle if you if you want to. Uh, well, I mean, I think well, yeah. Well, let's go through the broad strokes of the of the battle. Okay. But uh, we've already had a request to talk about uh, Nagumo and and his decision making in it. But I think it's it's more. I'm mean, I'm loving what you're doing, but I think I, I I don't want to get too much in the weeds of the battle. But yeah, let's okay. go through the broad strokes. Let's shift gears now. All that setup I think is vitally important because of what happens with Nagumo. Because now we switch back to the Japanese side, and Nagumo does bring four aircraft carriers for the midway assault. He only needs two, or the planes from two. But instead of launching that one air assault that would be needed with all of the planes from two carriers and reserving all of the planes from two carriers in case the Americans, heaven forbid, show up, he launches the attack with half the planes from all four carriers. 
Now, mathematically, that's equivalent, but it turns out militarily, it turned out to be a very bad idea because the remaining planes on the four carriers, he had armed with torpedoes and anti-ship weapons prudently in case the Americans show up. He didn't expect them to because the last reported location was in the South Pacific and they thought the rest of them must be around Pearl Harbor, which they couldn't really see, but they figured they had to be there. And uh, these these would planes armed with the anti-ship weapons would be there in case uh, they were wrong about that. Uh, the first assault, aerial assault on Midway occurs a uh, lot of damage to the uh, the Japanese. They, they lost a lot of planes and a lot of pilots and the planes are returning and their um, mission commander uh, radios Nagumo and says, you're going to have to assault, uh, you're going to have to have another one that we didn't completely wipe out uh, the Midway Air Force. And that's a prerequisite for the sh rest of the ships moving in to do the pummeling of the beaches. And so Nagumo orders that the, well, he had prudently had his task force launch uh, float planes to search for any possible American forces in that area. They did that at first light. And by the time the Gumo gets to this point where he needs to make this decision, they had already reached the end of their search arc and they were coming back and they didn't see a thing. So he felt it would be prudent to remove the torpedoes and the anti-ship weapons from the planes on all four carriers and rearm them for a second midway assault. And again, I will repeat that the second midway assault was only necessary because of the reinforcement that Nimitz did yeah. earlier in the month. Uh, so he starts doing that, and he's got to... Uh, th then the next thing is, he didn't find this out for about an hour, but one of his cruisers, the Tone, had a catapult problems and was an hour late launching its float plane. And the luck for the Japanese really starts falling apart at about this point, because as as it would you would have it, the the American task force was actually in the Tone's float plane search arc. So uh, Nagumo thinks the coast is clear, and about an hour later, he now gets a belated report from the search plane saying there's an American task force in the area and it's got carriers. So now he's got a Hobson's dilemma. What does he do? He's got this. These shot up planes coming back from Midway, they need to land. Their pilots, uh, many of them have been injured. They're running out of fuel. And he's got uh, uh, all the rest of the planes on the ships are being rearmed for a ground attack mission. He needs to rearm those again for an anti ship mission with back, put the torpedoes and the um, anti ship weapons back on. So that's kind of the plan. He's going to recover the Midway assault forces, rearm the planes for an anti ship uh, missions and then launch a well-thought-out, coordinated attack to these American carriers out there. But what he didn't know is that, obviously, they knew his location, and they had already launched their strike. And I'm bypassing a lot of the, the interesting, fascinating details of the actual battle itself to cut to the fact that at some point in there, American uh, dive bombers from those carriers find the Japanese carriers, and they uh, bomb them with just regular bombs, not torpedoes. And those bombs punch through the flight decks into these hangars that are strewn with torpedoes and anti-ship weapons and ground attack bombs and fuel hoses. And they cause a catastrophic chain reaction explosion on all of these carriers. Three of the four carriers sank within the first six minutes. The fourth carrier was heavily damaged and sank a few hours later. So at this point, Yorktown has eventually gets hit by torpedoes and eventually sinks. But at this point, the Japanese have lost four fleet carriers and the Americans have lost a lot of planes and a lot of extremely brave pilots, but they haven't lost any ships. So it's just a complete disaster for the, the Japanese at that point. And uh, for, for all, getting into that. Now, uh, the third point I want to make is that after this disaster, the Japanese did a lot of soul searching and they claim it was the, what they call victory disease. They were just too cocky and too complacent. And another big factor is they had had a lot of luck going for them so far in the first six months of the war. And then lady luck just turned against them. I mean, it just, everything that could go wrong for them did. Uh, they were surprised to, that Nimitz had, was there and that had carriers and, and, and all of those things. But that was uh 
uh, I think the, the Gumo decision to use planes from all of the carriers really hamstrung him when he needed to do the recovery and launch a, another attack. I mean, it's been argued, and I think Parcel and Tully get into that in their book, Chatter Sword. Uh, I mean, he had a couple of options. He could have launched an attack right then with what he had. And I think that's the consensus today that he probably should have, but that was not Japanese or anybody's naval doctrine at that time. So uh, we we can't really, I guess, expect that that he would have done that. Uh, after this uh, fiasco, N uh, Yamamoto still had combined fleet just a few hundred miles back. Uh, and so we get into some of the, the criticisms, and one of them was, why didn't Yamamoto use all of that power and combined fleet to go ahead and take Midway? He could have. Uh, he didn't. And the reason that he didn't was they were not there to take Midway. Midway was to be taken by the assault forces, and a week or two later, they would be a surprise. It's like having a hammer and an anvil, and somebody takes away your anvil. What do you do with your hammer? So that... They weren't. They really weren't set up to do that. Taking Midway at that point has no point. If you're not taking Midway, so that then you can ambush the American relief forces, there's no point in you taking it because they're going to come take it back. And uh, so anyway, that uh, another one was uh, this Aleutian assault. Uh, Yamamoto split his forces. Those forces would have done him. Uh, more good down in Midway rather than up in the Aleutians. Uh, but he really didn't split the Aleutian force. That attack was to take place the day before Midway. The Midway attack was just going to be the assault. The main attack, the decisive battle, wasn't going to occur for a week or two, plenty of time to get those Aleutian forces finished with their business up in Alaska and back down to Midway waters. And if he does that, and we kind of went over that, I mean, he ends up having... Uh, nine, the equivalent of nine aircraft carriers to Nemesis three, and the eight battleships to Nemesis none, and the 21 cruisers to Nemesis eight, and the 58 destroyers to Nemesis 15. And you have some qualitative differences as well. The 58 Japanese destroyers were armed with the long lance oxygen torpedo, the most advanced torpedo, I think, in the war, a long range or battleship killing warhead on it. Whereas Nimitz's 15 destroyers were armed with the Mark 15 torpedo, which had trouble keeping depth or usually ran in a circle. And if it hit something, it usually didn't explode. So it would have been, um, you know, a, a tremendous uh, defeat for, for the U.S. But that Aleutian uh, feint really wasn't a feint. It was not designed to lure the Americans off. It was just a, I think Parcel and Tully get into the debunking that illusion faint uh, theory. It was just a side uh, operation that really wasn't intended to interfere with the Midway operation at all. And in fact, after a few days, it would be there to support it. So that illusion faint uh, point um, uh, is one that I think that some people will read and think that that's what, there's a reason that we call it that. It was because there was a newspaper article about it that years ago that caused called it the illusion faint, but militarily it actually wasn't that. A couple of other interesting facts about the Battle of Midway. One of them is the Doolittle Raid. A lot of books will say that the, uh, the Midway was a response to the Doolittle Raid. And it is true that the Doolittle Raid did embarrass uh, the Japanese military leadership because the homeland was, they thought was sacred and couldn't be attacked by foreigners was in fact attacked by foreigners. Um, but the Doolittle Raid did not engender the, the Midway assault operation. Uh, Yamamoto knew he had to do that after Coral Sea, after his operation had been interfered with by the American carriers. He knew he had to have the decisive battle. Uh, the Imperial Japanese Navy, despite Yamamoto's position, didn't want to go along with it. There was a lot of opposition to it. And so Yamamoto threatened to resign if they didn't. So they had to acquiesce and, and agree to do it. The Imperial Japanese Navy, mainly because of the massive losses that they had occurred in some of these amphibious operations, they didn't want to go along with it either. But because of the 
power and persuasiveness of Yamamoto, they eventually had to do it. So they had agreed to the Midway assault operation several days before the Doolittle raid. And so the Doolittle raid was not the reason uh, for Midway. Although after the Doolittle raid, it sure looked like Yamamoto was right about that because those American carriers had to be taken care of. And so it, it did um, you know, improve his uh, level of support within both of those organizations, but they had officially been approved before that. Right. I'm, I'm just going to interrupt you and recap okay. our point you've made just so that people are up to speed. So okay. point one was what the Japanese planned to do at Midway. Point two was what actually happened. So your short, shortened version of the Battle of Midway, except for the fact we will come back and tackle the actual battle. We've done it already with Pastor and Tully, and we'll probably do it again. Point three was the reasons for the, the defeat there. Point four was the, the Yamamoto, but we did the illusion feint instead of you know the out of order, but illusion yeah. feint number five, and then number six were the Doolittle raid, and now yes. we're coming on to number seven. And this is the bit we really brought you on for, Henry. And if people are thinking, you know, we, we we did go through the battle quite quickly, well, we did go through the battle just like the movie. In fact, the movie does the battle in about six minutes in real time. But we're now yeah. on that more interesting side of that. What would have happened if Japan had won? If you want the details of the battle, uh, the Parcel and Tully Shattered Sword or Craig Simmons' uh, Midway book has that, you know, uh, I guess down to what color the candles were in uh, Yamamoto's washroom. But uh, I did want to get us to this point. And then the seventh point I want to make, and to me, this is the certainly the purpose of me writing the book, was what if the Japanese had won at Midway? Uh, what if Rochefort had not broken JN-25? What if he had not been able to convince Nimitz? And to me, this is the clearest sine qua non in the entirety of World War II because it would have been a catastrophic loss for the U.S. They would have lost uh, their base at Pearl Harbor and had to retreat to California waters. And then it has tremendous downstream effects, not just in the Pacific, but in the European theater, the Eastern Front, the Mediterranean, and North Africa, and even the Cold War. Because if you recall, after Pearl Harbor, and even after Hitler declared war on the United States, Churchill and Roosevelt meet at the Arcadia Conference, where the policy of the Allies is shall be Germany first. But because of the political situation in the U.S., it was that was a secret. Roosevelt didn't want to tell the American people because, as I said earlier, the American people wanted to go after Japan, hammer and tong, and didn't see, uh, saw the European war as kind of a British show, as kind of a sideshow for the Americans. They knew it was important, but uh, the fight in the Pacific, uh, they were more uh, in favor of, of, of that than, than they were or would have been the Germany first policy. So if you have the Americans now with Japanese ships patrolling the West coast of the United States, you know, occasionally firing some shells there, what, what happens to, to the world war two as we know it? Well, we would have certainly pulled a, a lot or most of our ships from the Atlantic to the Pacific. Uh, I don't know what that would have meant for Britain and the Battle of the Atlantic and the U-boat war, but uh, we wouldn't have maintained those force levels in the Atlantic. And we can also question what would that have meant for Lend-Lease, uh, which is one of those things Roosevelt had to sell politically to the Americans anyway. And I think that Lend-Lease aid to the UK would have continued in some form, maybe not as robust as beforehand, but I think it would have continued. But Lindley say to the Russians, which wasn't that popular politically in the U.S. to begin with, uh, I think that thing would have been in serious jeopardy if it even uh, was it was ended. It, it was a possibility of that. What would that have meant for American participation in North Africa or the combined bomber offensive or even the buildup for D-Day? Now, uh, these are not my own theories. I, I, a lot of these are from uh, others. And one in particular is uh, Dr. James Schlesinger, who is a former Secretary of Defense, a former head of the CIA, and the former head uh, Secretary of the Energy, Department of Energy, which in the United States is the department that uh, 
builds and maintains America's nuclear arsenal. And I just give you his background to show that he had once held the top position in America's uh, uh, national security operation, and he's not just some pundit. But Schlesinger, for the 60th anniversary of the Battle of Midway, posited this question, what if the U.S. forces had been defeated at Midway? That the Japanese would have dominated the Pacific, Hawaii would have been taken, the West Coast would have been under intermittent attack, and that has all sorts of political ramifications, as you can imagine. He says it would impose at least a two-year delay on our operations in Europe, and Stalin would have advanced much further to the West. Then he says the post-war shape of Western Europe would have uh, after the war would have been entirely different. David Glantz, who I'm sure many of your viewers are familiar with, one of the preeminent, if not the preeminent, World War II historian, certainly on the Eastern Front, made a similar claim that even without Lindley's, that the Russians might have been defeated, but even if they won, if Stalin won that by himself, then the Russian soldiers would have stopped only when they waited at France's beaches. So if you have a situation where you have VE Day with the so uh, Red Army occupying France and Italy, then you have a very different Cold War situation than the one that I I grew up with. So, I mean, it could be argued that the position of the Red Army on VE Day was affected by the outcome of a battle in the Pacific Ocean three years earlier, uh, because that loss would have been just so completely devastating to the American psyche that uh, it would not have been business as usual. The question is, how dramatic would those changes have been from World War II as we know it uh, to World War II where the Americans shift most of their resources uh, to the Pacific? And one of them in particular is point eight that I wanted to make is about the Manhattan Project. Uh, I don't think even a dramatic shift in, in uh, the American perspective from uh, uh, Germany first or the European war to one that was more focused, uh, more resources going to the Pacific would actually have affected the Manhattan Project. I don't believe that. I think America had enough industrial capacity to do both. But that turns out that is not the standard. The standard is that when General Leslie Groves took over the Manhattan Project, his very first act on his very first day was to go to the War Production Board and tell them that a AA-2 priority was not going to cut it. He had to have the AAA priority. It had to be the highest priority of any project in America during World War II. And not only that, he had to have a piece of paper in his desk with the special X priority on it that he could issue to himself if he decided he needed to do this. Well, the War Production Board said, you're crazy. We can't do that. We got all these demands on our economy. You know, we got to build aluminum and steel and tanks and guns and butter. And he said, well, if you don't give it to me, I'm going to leave here and I'm going to the White House and tell President Roosevelt that the War Production Board is not acquiescing to his wishes. And they thought, you know, this is gross, shift, throwing his weight around and being a jerk. But really, his point is very subtle, but it's a very important one. Groves felt that if we were not willing to go all out on something as risky as this was, because they didn't even know if it would work, it was going to take 138,000 of the highest skilled workers in America, consume more than 10% of the electric power generated in World War II that could have been used for making aluminum or steel, and it was going to use all sorts of scarce, rare, and exotic materials. And they weren't going to be able to do a thing where they would you know, have slowly scaled this up to pilot plants and so forth. They literally had to go from microscopic tabletop experiments with plutonium you couldn't even see with the naked eye to the largest industrial plants ever built. The K-25 plant at Oak Ridge was literally the largest industrial plant ever built. Uh, it was going to use more nickel than uh, was produced in the world in a year. They came up with a way not to do that. The plant next to it, Y-12, which was the electromagnetic separation plant, was going to use so much copper for the electromagnetic coils that if they had built it as designed, we wouldn't have been able to make bullets because we wouldn't have had enough copper to make brass. They ended up using 12,000 tons of silver from the U.S. Treasury to make the electromagnets. The thing had a huge scale. His view was, if you're not willing to go all in and do it that way, then there's chances we won't have a working weapon during the war. And if that's not your goal, then we ought to rethink it. We'll build pilot plants. 
uh, we'll build uh, laboratories that can do all sorts of experiments. But the last component of that, these huge industrial plants, we wouldn't do during the war. We'll, we'll do that once we kind of have all this figured out. But that's not the, but he said, if you do, do want to have it during the war, you're going to have to build up. There were five ways that they knew of that you could make fissionable materials. And he built industrial scale plants for every one of those starting from day one when they didn't even know how to do any of that. So my only point about the Manhattan Project is if you have a massive shift in priorities early in the war, the Manhattan Project could have gotten caught up in that. And even if they took grows down just one notch, I think he would have completely changed uh, the direction of that program. There's no way to prove that, but I think uh, it's it's uh, certainly not a given that it would have continued business as usual if the rest of the entire war economy had been shifted. The point is, Henry, you're giving us points to think about. That's the, yeah. the, the ideal World War II TV show is we learn a few things and we go away thinking, hmm, which, which hmm. brings us well to, the, to your point nine, which I think is my favorite because I'm an unashamed ETO guy, really, which is you mentioned it already, but you're going to expand on it now, the idea of Germany first. Yeah, I think that even though this is a battle that took place in the Pacific, and I don't want to take anything away from the fact that it was obviously hugely impactful for the Pacific War, no question of that. But I think the biggest beneficiary of the victory at Midway was Germany first. Because now we're coming in at really for the start of the American participation in any real meaningful way about six months after Pearl Harbor. And in doing that, that enabled, that took some of the pressure off of Roosevelt, some of the political pressure off of Roosevelt. And, you know, we started this conversation talking about politics. Now we have backfooted the Japanese. We have, we have revenged Pearl Harbor. Uh, the Japanese our forces are really in serious disarray after this. I mean, it is, there's light at the end of the tunnel. And I think any rational observer looking at what the situation is in the Pacific right now can clearly see how this thing is going to end. So that enables Roosevelt then to put iron in the glove as far as Germany first. After Midway, Roosevelt can let the UK and USSR have from through Lindley's basically anything they ask for. Uh, he was able to send 250 Sherman tanks to Monty in North Africa that Monty used with great effect, turning the tide to the El Alamein. You get the... Um, Combined bomber offensive, you get the Battle of the Atlantic, you get the buildup for D-Day. I mean, basically, World War II as we know it basically comes from that crossroads at 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 Midway, the Battle of Midway. And it was because of the en enabling politically for Roosevelt to shift uh, the emphasis to Germany first. And it wasn't just the policy decision, because that's really what Churchill and Roosevelt had agreed to in Arcadia. They were actually able to actually do Germany first from that moment on, and they would have been hamstrung had it gone the other way. Hmm. Uh, well, David, and then, sorry, he's making the point that FDR was going to do what FDR was going to do, and then then create the conditions for public opinion. Uh, eventually, that's what. So David's saying that may. He's not saying you're wrong. He's adding the the idea that Roosevelt is very strong willed and very determined to do it, but it gives him. What you're saying is it gives him lots of reasons that what he's doing is the is it's giving him the public support of what he's doing as opposed to doing it without the public support. I think is the point you're making, right? Yes, I, I completely agree that I mean Roosevelt, I think, was the greatest politician we've ever had to serve as president. I, I there's no doubt in my mind that he would eventually be able to bring the American people around to doing what he needed to do. The problem with all of that was the timing. I mean, he eventually brought the American people around to the, uh, you know, there were several neutrality acts that prohibited us from selling any kind of munitions to Britain at its hour, mm. hour of need. And eventually the last neutrality act that actually allows us to do that is on a cash and carry basis. And Britain was the only one with the cash and the ability to carry. So, uh, but it took years of, you know, political persuasion to get the American public from having a 50% isolationist America first stance and even being hesitant to do things like Lindley's. Would he have gotten that done? Yeah, I think he was a great enough politician that he would have, but how long would it have taken and how, 
it would have just made the struggle that much harder for uh, Britain and the Soviets and everybody else. But I think I would agree with your commenter that uh, I think he would largely get what he wanted to do. It would have just taken him a lot of time and effort to do that, that he didn't have to do. I mean, that it, it was much easier for him to uh, send things to the Russians and to the British and to North Africa and the Mediterranean and, and as opposed to doing everything for the Pacific. And even in 1943, there were very few public opinion polls taken during the war, but in 1943, a year later, 60% of the American public still saw Japan as the main threat and only 30% saw Germany. So yes, he could have done it because he's so skilled, but it would have been an effort it, and it would have taken a lot of time. Wave of opinion or a lot more of the wave of the opinion with you than doing it against the flow, isn't it? And as you say, oh, yeah. 43, yeah, that, that statistic you just gave us is that 60% are still in favor of Japan first. So he's he's swimming against the tide as opposed to midway helping him to swim. Yes, maybe a lot easier with, to swim, swim with it's it. Still in still water. He's not fighting against anything. Yeah, and it's not still water. I mean, I think at that point, <clears throat> there uh when I talk about, you know, what the American people did and didn't think about this, obviously it's a very diverse group and a lot of them, uh, maybe even a slight majority saw Hitler as the greater threat. So you didn't have to pull, they were all in favor of, uh, or would have been in favor of Germany first. Uh, and so it was, uh, it, it, it didn't take that much to convince the rest of them that, um, because of the catastrophic defeat, the it, the fact that that uh, we were on top and we really didn't have, we could take care of Japan in, in, in our own good time. Uh, that enabled him to do a lot of things that otherwise would have been difficult for him to do. And a lot of those decisions that would have been uh, difficult to make. Mm. So the 10th point. We'll, point just the one, we'll go there. Just Ian Carr is, uh, sorry, no, not Ian. Uh, yeah. I, Dave Collins is making the point about Admiral King being an Anglophobe, and that's an understatement. He he hated us, didn't he? And it's yes. definitely worth pointing out that Nimitz's stock rises massively with Midway, doesn't it? Which which you know King King probably has more influence before Midway, but Nimitz absolutely has influence after Midway, and 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 if King has more more influence, that also impacts on lend lease and relationships with Great Britain and Nimitz, as you said. And I'm looking forward to Craig Simon's new new biography of, of Nimitz, and we're going to have him on the show at some point, hoping to talk about that. Is that Nimitz is like Doolittle did after the Doolittle raid, you know? And I, I did a show about how people a signed photo of a Doolittle went for something crazy money in 1942 because the public thought he was great. Doolittle and Nimitz are, are you know America's greatest heroes in in, in the middle part of, of 1942, aren't they? And that has a big bearing on things. Well, uh, yeah, and I think within in the bureaucracy, certainly of the Navy, when you are a senior commander and you have a lopsided victory over your uh, enemy that's just an existential threat to your, your country's existence, yes, you're going to have a lot of clout from that mm -hmm. moment on. Uh, I mean, King obviously was running the show. He had uh, Roosevelt's ear for a lot of, again, political reasons that had to do with uh, his fallout with Admiral Stark, but, uh, and King had a lot of influence, but, uh, you know, King, King is a very complex guy because he would say a lot of things. I mean, he, he certainly uh, trash mouthed uh, the British Admiralty Royal Navy all the time, but he then ended up doing a lot of things that were, uh, very helpful to the British. So it is a very, like most people, very complex, uh, complex guy. But uh, again, and you just did it live, you can take certain events or things that are going on in the European theater, the Mediterranean, Eastern Front, and tie some of that back to at least it would have been something to have to think about in the war, whether you could do this or do that, uh, because of the uh, Battle of Midway, because that's the only theater where once that Battle of Midway was done, it, it was so clear that American industrial capacity and technology and, and all the rest of it would clearly defeat the Japanese 
at some point it was just a question of how much we wanted to spend to do it and what timetable we wanted to do it in and the number of casualties that we were willing uh, to exp to suffer in order to do it but the exact outcome i don't think uh even if they were wrong that's what they believed and i think they were right about that as well whereas there were times uh, uh earlier on that we couldn't be sure of that uh in the european theater so no definitely and I, I, you know that's the point you're making is midway is more than just the, the the military victory it was it was a turning point for politics it was turning point public opinion so on and so forth but your your last point number 10 is about is about our hero again um our, our, our and we and i'd like you to explain a little bit about the slippers and dressing gown kind of thing but you know this 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 instigator of the success it was his information and his department that then nimitz uses but his 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 career afterwards was interesting. So I'll hand it back to yes. you. Yes. Uh, yes. Well, let, let's get to some of this because uh, Roachford uh, is the well in the in the nineteen seventy six movie where he's played by actor Hal Holbrook. I think they they have him wear a silk kimono or something like that, and. Almost anything that you read about Roachford talks about him wearing a silk or satin dressing gown and slippers and so forth. And you only get a real good view of what he he was like by reading uh, Elliot Carlson's excellent biography of him. And then you do that, you find out that, first of all, it was a smoking jacket. It wasn't a kimono. And he, the reason that he wore it was he was perpetually cold the hypo operation was in but, but for security reasons was in the windowless basement of the 14th naval district in honolulu and that's where the air conditioning plant for the building was so that building was over air conditioned and he lived down there sometimes 24 hours a day and slept on his desk uh, he lived off of coffee and sandwiches and although this has been redacted from his oral history some sort of stimulant like benzodrine that was apparently a bowl of them sitting on his desk now in the oral history they wipe that out and make him say no dose pills but it's pretty clear what it is so he's down there just a nervous wreck trying to decode this japanese which is if you get into the technical details of of how he did it and what he had to do it's just mind-boggling but anyway uh hal holbrook plays him in the in the uh, the movie wearing the thing and it was just a smoking jacket because he kept his pipe in one pocket and his tobacco and another was the only thing he had that with the big enough pockets and he did wear what is they call slippers but they were bedroom shoes they weren't some kind of fancy thing with the turned up toe and a bell on it and the reason he wore house shoes as we would call them or bedroom shoes is because it was a concrete floor and he was on his feet all day sometimes 20 plus hours a day and his feet hurt so when you get into what he really did and what the reasons for it, it make, it's perfectly sensible. But, you know, when you do the Hollywood treatment for it, then they go overboard. But um, the, the 10th point that I wanted to make was that you would think where we can clearly point to a single individual and their action that so clearly made it, that victory possible. I mean, he didn't fight during the Battle of Midway, and a lot of people did, and a lot of people sacrificed themselves and lost their lives. I'm not taking anything away from that. But let's face it, they wouldn't be have been there in order to be able to demonstrate their prowess and devotion, to quote Churchill, if not for Roachford and the code break of Jan 25. It just wouldn't, wouldn't have happened. And you would think that after this tremendous victory that Roachford would be hailed a hero. But that's not how it turned out. And the reason was because the Redmond brothers, who had Admiral King's ear, that you know, I should say that cryptography and cryptological intelligence was so closely held, uh, at least on the American side. Now, the British, through Bletchley Park, had developed systems for disseminating that information, and they had kind of a well-oiled machine. The Americans didn't. And you saw that in Pearl Harbor, where the the intelligence we got from the purple machines didn't really go to the right places, certainly didn't go to Hawaii. 
I don't think it would have done any good, but nevertheless, it didn't. And so with so few people knowing the truth about what was going on, it was very easy for the senior Redmond brother to go around to the senior officers in the Navy and basically say that it was his little brother who actually had broken the code and saved the day at Midway. And uh, there was no one who knew any better who could uh, uh, contradict him. Um, Admiral Nimitz said to his staff that Roachford deserved a major share of the credit for the victory at Midway, but Nimitz only said it to his staff, and most of Nimitz's own staff didn't even know who N uh, Roachford was or what he did because it was so secret. Um, Nimitz then tried to get the Distinguished Service Medal for Roachford and wrote that up and sent it into Washington. And Admiral King had the Redmond brothers take a look at it because they were his communications guys. And they came back to King. And of course, they don't want Roach for getting a DSM for the victory at Midway because the senior Redmond brother was telling everybody it was his little brother who had done it. So that can't happen. And so they told uh, King he should deny it because Roach really didn't. He was just an ex-Japanese language dude and really named it anything. So he doesn't get the DSM. And I asked Stephen Budiansky, who wrote um, The Battle of Wits, which is a, a detailed book on how that code break, those code breaking operations against Japan worked, not just uh, in, in uh, Hawaii, but also in uh, uh, Hong Kong and uh, Australia and uh, Ceylon and Corregidor. And I asked him once, I said, why? Why didn't Nimitz go to bat more for Roachford? And he thought about it and he said, uh, well, pro the only answer he could come up with, he said, you know, Nimitz decided that he would either have to fight uh, Washington and the Redmond brothers, or he would have to fight the Japanese and he chose to fight the Japanese. And I think that's as good an explanation as we're ever going to get. Um, the part of this that, still bothers me no matter how much I think about it and how much I've read about it and how much I've written about it was right after this, they, they realized they would have to get Roachford out of the way. So they had him on temporary duty to Washington. Basically he was supposed to explain the, how he did all this stuff. And they arranged for him to not ever go back to Hawaii. They arranged for him to be reassigned to command a floating dry dock in San Francisco and Roachford never worked on codes again. Um, it, it took uh, more than 40 years really for the truth to come out. And this is an interesting thing. And it's one that I think that you face a lot in covering World War II was the fact that the, the successes that the allies had mostly the British, and in some cases like this one, the Americans, in decoding the German and Japanese, in some cases Italian communications during the war, was still secret up until the late 1960s. Uh, it was actually 1967 that we get uh, the incredible victory by Walter Lord that finally introduces us to Roachford and starts telling us a little bit about what went on with the cryptographic successes at Midway. You also get that year, David Kahn's groundbreaking book, The Code Breakers, which was uh, NSA attempted to suppress it and to smear Kahn's reputation. It didn't work, but uh, we still, it was just a trickle. It wasn't until F.W. Winterbotham's uh, book, The Ultra Secret in 75, that we have in open literature, what actually started, was going on at Bletchley Park. And there was all these attempts to suppress that uh, by the British and American authorities. And that was at a time, we're talking now into the 60s and 70s, by then all the major players in World War II, the Pattons and the Eisenhowers and the Montgomerys and the Dowdings had written their memoirs. And a lot of the major books had already been written and there was no mention of cryptography and the successes at Bletchley Park and Hawaii and other places. And so even today, if you're writing in this field and you pull a book that was, uh, you know, written by uh, Churchill or Eisenhower or someone else 
back in the 40s, 50s, or 60s, and you read about how this battle came about and what they knew and what they did, they're leaving out all the parts about cryptography which and cryptology. In some cases, it was important. And in other cases like this one, it was absolutely vital. I mean, it, 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 it couldn't have happened without that. So, uh, and today, well, the one other final example about this is that in 1969 and 70, Rochefort recorded his uh, oral history about actually what went on in this operation. And when he was finished taping, his oral history was confiscated by NSA and kept under lock and key for the next 12 years until 1982. So it's not until 1982 that we really find out this story that I'm telling you now. And that's a long time after World War II. A lot of the this stuff has been written and that that uh, that pain has dried by now. Now you can go back as I and others have done and kind of, well, what, who knew what, when, and what really happened, but it certainly doesn't have, you know, the same, uh, impact, I think, as, as all of those things that were written before it without benefit of that cryptologic intelligence, which played such a huge role for the allies in world war two. Now one, uh, bright spot in this is that, by 1984, uh, President Reagan was president, and he was a big proponent of the Navy and was doing a lot of you know, uh, buildup of America's uh, Navy, which had fallen on hard times. He was building a 500-ship Navy, and he had a very bright Secretary of the Navy, John Lehman, a PhD in engineering, former naval aviator. And Lehman in 1984 heard this story, and so he went to President Reagan and in 1984, President Reagan awarded Rochefort, unfortunately, posthumously, the Distinguished Service Medal and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. His family at least got it, and he certainly deserved uh, that and more. Uh, Rochefort, unlike the Redmonds, is actually enshrined today in the NSA's uh, Cryptologic Hall of Fame. And if you go to Hawaii, NSA has a Cryptologic Center there, and it's in the Joseph J. Regman building. So belated and in my view, not nearly enough kudos uh, for this guy and what he was able to do. But that pretty much um, is, is what happened uh, after that. The Redmonds, of course, went on to great glory in their careers and and uh, uh, not not Roachford and, and his associates, however. So, but I mean, as a Brit, you've got to be familiar with that because look how Dowding was treated and Park and uh, uh, Turing and yeah. uh, Gordon Welchman and uh, Tommy Flowers. I mean, I could go on, but you know. Uh, well, you're, 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 you're speaking, David O'Keefe is watching and David O'Keefe is, is our Mr. Ultra, Mr. Bletchley, Mr. Sig Int and, and professor of history in Canada and been a frequent guest. And yeah, it's, the, the, you, you made a very valid point that although there are books now, even the last 20 or 30 years, that fully include naval intelligence, they fully include code breaking and ultra and all the results of it. The fact is those books you talked about that were written in the 40s, 50s, 60s, they still exist. They've, they've not been re-edited. They're out there still on people's bookshelves. They're out there in the libraries. They're out there on the bookshelves. And it's you know back to that whole big discussion of, of historiography and the, the perceptions of history over the generations. But We'll do a couple of questions now, folks. The okay. first one I will do, and I've got to go back and find it, and it was from Benjamin Allen, and it is, uh, it's an it's a, it's a obvious one. What is your take on the most recent cinematic portrayal of the Battle of Midway? So we're talking about the sort of, was it three years ago now movie? What was your general feeling about it? I didn't watch that one. I was, okay. so, I was so appalled at the first one, and I thought it would influence uh my writing on this so i have actually not well watched it maybe i sh at this point now can safely go back but i mean you have to do that there are certain things that uh you if you're writing a book and you can't there's certain books that you can't read because it's so close to your genre you don't want to you know pick up anything and there's certain ones that you know what they're going to say and you don't want to be influenced, but you want to go in a different direction. So I have not seen it, but now I think I have the opportunity to, to do that. I'm well, sure I will. Have the general consensus is don't watch it. Brad on this day in Canadian military history is saying, don't watch it. So boring. 
Uh, David O'Keefe is saying, no, don't do okay. it. Okay, if David O'Keefe says don't um, watch it, then... Great to is saying don't ever watch it. I, I watched it, and, and it, you know, it was... It was popcorn. I watched it, and and everything that I'd seen, I'd forgotten two minutes later. It was just, you know, like like watching a superhero movie. It was all flash and bang, and it was all right, I suppose. But it's not it's not in any way a sort of serious document to take forward. So, um, and the sad thing is that it, there are at least ten fabulous stories in that Battle of Midway. Any one of which could be make a great a, movie. A fab- yeah, yeah. So David Collins, David Collins is asking, where can we purchase your books on Lendlease? Well, I have a lot of Lendlease description in this book. I don't. That's one of the again the things that is not covered very much about World War II. That's a program that we have. We really need to do one of these days. And the reason for it again, it goes back to the politics. After the war, uh, well, the Russians. I mean, you can't find the video of Russians on the Eastern Front. It's very difficult finding them driving Studebaker trucks, which they had 400,000 of. Yeah. Anytime you see the video, they're driving uh, a Zill or whatever they're, they're Yeah, the they're Russian makes was. Yeah. Uh, and we ship them a lot of tanks and planes, and you just won't see that in the Soviet footage for obvious reasons, because they'd want to do that. Uh, after the war, anytime an American diplomat brought up to the Russians about we helped you during the war with Lindley's, the Russians would say, yeah, World War II was one with American spam and Russian blood, and they weren't wrong. You know, I mean, it's a lot of truth in that. And in America, by the time we get to the point where we should be celebrating the victory that we got from Lindley's, because I think it was vitally important, uh, so does David Glantz. Uh, by the time you do that, we're in a Cold War. The Russians are now our ad- ungrateful adversaries. And it's not politic in America to to mention the fact that during the war we helped out the Russians. We just don't want to do it. So nobody wants to mention it. They want to downplay the effects of it. I have some highlights and and bits and pieces of some things that I found in researching Lindley's. I thought were quite interesting on the kinds of things that we supplied uh, to the uh, British and to the Soviets. So there's little pieces in there. But there's really not much scholarly work on Lindley's and not many popular books on Lindley's. And that's one of the things that people don't talk about that much. But if you look at uh, how much stuff we shipped, and it was, you know, vital stuff. I mean, the Russians could do a lot of things, but they would get to the point where they needed, you know, brass sheaves for something. Well, they could get those from Lindley's. They didn't have to make everything and they could build... T-34 tanks and and other things. But now Stalin apparently told Khrushchev, quote, Stalin is saying that without Lindley, the Soviets would have lost the war. I I don't believe that. I don't think historians believe that. But uh, Zhukov said at one point the the Russians didn't even have uh, powder for their bullets. They had to get that from Lindley. So it had a huge impact. It's a thing that is not covered uh, enough, in my opinion, in discussions of World War II. We say that amateurs study tactics and professionals study study logistics yeah exactly and then then we ignore the biggest logistics operation in world history as churchill said the most uh, unsorted act of any nation uh and so if if logistics are that important really then we all of us should stop and take a look at lindley's Thanks for the well, question. Well, I think, I think Len Lease will come back into it because I don't want to talk about modern politics because we kind of refrain from talking about what's going on in Ukraine. But the last 20, 30 years has been an era of making sure we include the Russians, the Red Army, the Soviets in the victory over world, you know, in World War II. We've been trying to bring them in to the Brotherhood. So books written so 20 years ago, you know, don't forget while Normandy is happening, there's migration happening. Don't worry. Well, that's not the, the next phase is going to be trying to not push the Russians out, but we remind ourselves how much the Allies help the Russians because that's how it's going to shift. So I, I can see lend coming back into the narrative in the next 20 years post, however, this sit- awful situation in Ukraine um, sorts itself out. I think there'll be a need to kind of dismiss some of the Soviet efforts in World War II to make ourselves feel better. So I think it'll shift that way. But um, uh yeah, and there's lots of conversation in the sidebar about all the stuff we sent them, uh, including, you know, uh, alum- aluminum or aluminium, as I would say, industrial diamonds, uh, chemicals, uh, and we've, we've discussed that before. So um, 
basically, I think we will bring things to an end now, Henry. But um, your 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 book, it's only came out in April. So tell us where people can get um, the man who won World War Two. Uh, anywhere good books are sold, Paul. Good. Uh, obviously, the the usual suspects. Um, but it's on the uh, I think Bookshelves UK. Uh, yeah. It's it's on. Uh, it's available. We have a the 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 world's book distributors here in Nashville. It's Ingram, and uh, it's an Ingram system. So you could you could obtain a copy at any bookstore or online if you're uh, interested in. Cool. And doing that. And what, what's your next project? What what's next? Are you still going to sort of stick with Midway and Lendley? So is there because you've done you've done other books as well? Are you, are, you, are you moving into another theater or war or or area of study? Uh, I haven't decided. I mean, most of the things that I've written before uh, were actually about uh, technology. I mean, I've uh, about video editing and television production. This is a story. I heard this, I read about it when I was a teenager, and this, then it starts off with, you first page, the Americans just happened to be in the right place at the right time, and then everything is from that. It was like, how did that happen? I mean, that seems like a coincidence. And so this is a story uh, that I've been interested in since I was a teenager, and I wanted to explore those different uh, aspects of it. Not, again, as you pointed out, not from the uh what are the, all of the, the bells and whistles and nuts and bolts about the actual battle itself which everybody or other people at least have covered brilliantly and in every kind of detail uh i didn't want to do that i just wanted to look at particularly the the schlesinger thesis of what would have happened if we had lost because i think all of us would have grown up in a completely different world uh than the one that we grew up in if that, if that had happened and I don't think there's any battle in World War II, not Kursk, not D-Day, not uh, Stalingrad, not the Battle of the Bulge, that had as much impact. I'm with Robert Satino on this, that I don't think there was a turning point because I think I think the Allies were going to win no matter what. It was just a question of how yeah. long is it going to take and what is it going to cost? So you can't have a turning point because there's nothing to turn from. But I think that the impact, that, uh, I don't even think it's the most important battle. I mean. I, but I think that's had the most impact of any battle in World War II. No, so. and that's a good point. And as, as some people have said, that they can read it and they will have different opinions and some will agree with you and some. And that, that it, the point is it sparks conversation. It sparks, we can get, get a bit caught up. We said it earlier in the kind of the weeds of flight decks and bombs and armaments and fuses and things like that. And actually there's a much larger picture Bin midway we talk about it a lot on this channel. 1942 is the year where lots of things are kind of on the knife edge. Lots of things could go one way, they could go the other way. And and it's one of those, I, I don't like turning points because if you start li listing turning points, you have to list so many turning points. It becomes, because to try and break it down to just three or four turning points in World War II is, is, is clearly overlooking so many, many, many others, but lots and lots of turning points. But anyway, we will bring things to an end. So, um, uh, I'm going to have had a couple of requests to bring you back in the future. So I think a show on lend -Lease would be really interesting, breaking down what it was, where it went, what they sent. That would be very nice. I'd be happy to do that one day. All right. Well, I've uh, enjoyed being on your channel. I watch your show all, shows all the time. You almost always have very interesting guests. Uh, probably not today, but normally you do. And no, uh, people have liked it. Views, views were good. So I will just remind people what we're coming. I'll come back and say goodbye to you in a second. So, folks, we have two point to hawk shows coming over for you at you the next two days. So tomorrow, Joanna McDonald is coming on to talk about the men who fought at Point to Hawk. She interviewed uh, lots of rangers of her fantastic book, which is hard to get now. Uh, liberation of Pointy Hawk. So she'll be telling us about the people that are involved and have friendships with them and what they told her when she interviewed them. And then on Saturday, Steve Zaloga is coming back for part two of his kind of modern appraisal of Pointy Hawk. He took us through the German defenses there a few weeks ago, and now he's going to be talking about the plan, the execution of the plan, how the, what the Rangers did on D-Day, the bombing, all that kind of stuff. So that's two things. And then next week, I'll be getting all listed tomorrow, is our first New Zealand at war week on World War II, which I'm really excited about because uh, people have been asking me to do stuff about New Zealand for ages, and I finally found lots of New Zealand historians for you. So that's coming up next week, and then lots more as we go into summer. So I'm going to bring Henry back in to say goodbye. So um, thank you for joining us, Henry, and I All will right. book you at some point for Lindley's show. I've got you to say yes, so I will be in touch about that. So cheers All right. for joining us, cheers. and 
everybody else watching. This is Paul Weller from World War II TV. I will see you again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Bye. -bye.